Welcome to Redemption Church Online. We are a gospel-centred Anglican church here in Craigieburn, Melbourne's North, and our vision and desire is to see this suburb and its surrounding suburbs saturated with the good news of Jesus. We're so delighted you've been able to join us today in homes and watch parties or wherever you're watching from. You'll have an opportunity in this video to sing along and worship God in song, to hear the Bible read and a sermon on Psalm 1 today. After this video, I encourage you to join us at 4.45pm for a Zoom meeting so we can just chat and meet others and encourage one another. And the link will be in the slides at the end of this time, but also in the description of this video. Hope to see you there. Our Bible reading for today is Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the way of the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law this one meditates day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction.
Often do you think about what you think about? I'll say that again. How often do you think about what you think about? I wonder if it's not often, and I'm sure there would be many of us in that boat. For part of my week in my other role, I work for an organisation that provides mental health clinicians like psychologists, counsellors and um, pastoral counsellors as well as chaplains and consultants to workplaces to help people and organisations to thrive, particularly in the well-being space. Recently, I've been rewriting and updating some of these programs and consulting packages that we take to businesses and individuals, particularly around the topic of mental well-being and mental health. And I've been working on a presentation on resilience and mental well-being. And I, I was in a meeting with the supervisor and we were having this really robust and energizing conversation, throwing ideas around and having this big discussion about how a large part of the human experience day to day is shaped by what we spend energy and time thinking about, which of course in turn also shapes our perception and perspective of the world. And the supervisor just made this one comment and the supervisor said, it really boils down to this, doesn't it? What are you focusing on? Is it 
Good and inspiring and life-giving? Or is it nasty and inward and stress-inducing? And as the supervisor said this, I smiled, and in the back of my mind, this scripture from Philippians 4, 8 went off in my mind. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. For example, if you, you and I only ever watch the news all day long or scroll on Facebook all day long uh, and fill our minds with stress-inducing and bad things and thought about all of the things that could go bad or all of the things that annoy us about the world and get our blood pressure raised, then that creates a climate in our mind and our emotions where stress and anxiety can easily find a home. We can become addicted to drama and when we do that, then everything we experience in the world, we filter through that addiction to drama or bad news. Uh, I thought to myself, isn't this interesting that the whole mental health world is instinctively and only now maybe catching up with and beginning to understand what the Bible has been teaching and saying all along, that part of the human experience is very much determined by what goes on between the space in our, between our two ears, what we spend our time thinking about, and that how we think about things very much filters how we interpret the world and our experiences from a day-to-day -day basis. You heard it here first from the Word of God, and the mental health world is beginning to catch up and understand this, but not the full picture. If we have this treasure in the Word of God for our own good, then we've got to delve into it, learn about it, engage with it, and practice it. Psalm 1, which we heard read earlier, teaches us that there are two ways to live, two mindsets, two ways of engaging with life that have two very different outcomes. One way to live leads to life and peace, blessing and flourishing. The other way leads to death and destruction. Two ways to live, two choices, two types of people. One type of person is grounded in a particular way of life, bearing one type of result, while another type of person, grounded in the opposite way of life, bearing the opposite result. Let's look at each person separately. Person one, the one we want to be. Person one is described as blessed. Verse one says, blessed is the one. Blessed here is not talking about material prosperity necessarily, but is talking about a state of being uh, sometimes, and not inaccurately translated as happy, whole, all parts of that person being at peace and flourishing. Why is this person blessed? Well, we read in verse 1, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of the sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. The person is blessed for not doing certain things, not having the lifestyle, the attitude, the way of thinking or speech that the wicked do. So they're blessed for not doing certain things, but also are blessed for doing something very specific. One thing in this case, we read on in verse 2, blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord and who meditates on God's law day and night. Blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. Blessed is the one who meditates on the word of God day and night. There is a state of being and a state of mind that comes from what it is we delight in and what it is we meditate on the most. In this case, Psalm 1 is saying the state of blessedness, the, the mind state of being blessed is about delighting in and meditating on the word of God. Blessedness comes from delighting in God's law and meditating on his word day and night. Delight is a matter of the heart. Meditation is a matter of the mind. And those two things are interchangeable. Whatever you delight in, whatever you love, and whatever you find joy in, inevitably creates a corresponding climate, a culture in your heart. Whatever you spend time thinking about the most creates a lens, a perspective, a perception through which we see and experience everything else. 
Now just to note here, here when it says meditate, it doesn't mean sit quietly and think about nothing, about emptying your mind. And that is not a Christian way of meditating. Christian meditation has almost nothing in common with Eastern meditative practices, where, whereas in Hinduism or in the New Age world, meditation means emptying one's mind. In Christianity, meditation means filling your mind with good things, things to think over, thinking over things deeply, chewing over things, chewing on truth until the juice of joy and delight is produced. So what does this person who is blessed do? Well, this person who is blessed delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on God's word day and night. I know this for myself when I'm regularly in the word and praying through scripture, I am in a better mood. I'm able to process my experiences better. I'm able to hold things in perspective better. God's perspective, of course. So it's not a surprise that I feel better and I'm living more in line with God's values and I'm able to interpret the things that are happening around me, the things I hear, the things I see from God's point of view. There's a study in 2016 by the Barna Group that suggested and showed through data that those who spend regular time in God's word and in prayer are much better emotionally regulated than those who don't necessarily. For example, a reduction in anger or aggression. It's fascinating. I will uh, send you the link one day if you'd like to read that sort of research. But I recognise the moment I personally get busy and I let my engagement and saturation in God's word slide, I know that other attitudes and perceptions and perspectives and ways of seeing and feeling will want to start competing for my mind and start competing for my heart. The thing we've got to do here and to learn to do here is to learn to love God's word and to live in and from God's word. Obviously, it doesn't mean that you 24-7 spend your time only reading the Bible. It doesn't mean that you don't go about your everyday life. What it does mean is, like what Psalm 119 says, is that you ingest, you chew and hide God's word in your heart so that you may not sin while you go about the rest of your life. But what happens when we do this? Well, in verse 3, we read that this person who doesn't engage in the ways of the wicked, but loves God's word and chew and meditates on it day and night, the result is that that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. Again, these promises of fruitfulness and prosperity should not be read as to mean money and possessions or material things. It's talking about a fruitfulness and a prosperity of one's soul and mind and heart. So blessed is the one who does not live, behave and think like a wicked person. But blessed is the one who meditates and loves God's law, meditates on a day and night. That person is like a tree that is well watered, fruitful, not withering, but flourishing. And we all want to be that person, don't we? We want to experience that mindset and that state of being of blessedness, of communion with God that is so precious and deep that we experience a peace in our whole being, a wholeness. We all want to be that person. And that blessedness that we're talking about is described in the Bible in other places, in other ways. There's so much in God's word to tell us to watch what we're thinking about. For example, in Romans 8, 6, it says that the mind that is set on the flesh is death, but the mind that is set on the spirit is life and peace. Romans 12, verse 2, later on, says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The mind is really important for a Christian. We don't just throw our brains out at conversion, but they're to be transformed. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your mind on things above, not on things below, not on earthly things. Now, to do all of that is not to ignore that there are issues in life. It's not to ignore that there are problems in life. It's not to ignore reality. It's not to ignore the news. It's not to ignore the negative things that happen or the negative things we're feeling and thinking about. But to do that is about asking the question about what is the dominant default resting place 
of your thought life? What are you thinking about? What is your mind set on? What is the dominant thing that occupies your brain space? Is it the things of God and the word of God and life in the spirit? Or is it something else? Because if it's something else, that something else will produce different outcomes to what we've just heard about. Instead of life and peace, it will be death and destruction. Not immediate physical death and violent destruction like in the movies, but slow death, destruction to the quality of relationships, the quality of our internal world, the quality of our emotions, the quality of our enjoyment of God's presence. Those things decay when it's something else that domin dominates our thinking. Instead of being firmly planted, it's a life that is blown away and blown all around like chaff. Precisely what Ephesians 5.14 is warning against. Not being tossed around to and fro, blown around by every wind of doctrine or people's trickery or by craftiness and deceitful scheming. The Bible warns against that. So let's look at this second part of the psalm, which gives a bit more warning about what a life of um, wickedness or dominated by wickedness looks like. The second part of the psalm says, not so the wicked, not so as, a, as opposed to the blessed one, not so the wicked, they are like chaff, they are blown away by the wind. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This talk today is meant to encourage us to want the blessedness that is described in the first part of this psalm. The blessedness of the presence of God, the blessedness of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, the blessedness of seeing things correctly and rightly the way God sees them. But the reality is that you and I can't think our way into that kind of blessedness Particularly, apart from God, our minds don't want those things until we're born again. And the way that happened is that God sent his son Jesus, the totally blessed one, not by his performance, but by who he is. God sent the totally blessed one, his son Jesus Christ, to take our place, the place of the wicked, to be cut off from life be blown away by the fury of God's wrath into the jaws of death and destruction. He shows us what a life of wickedness can look like, even though he himself committed no wickedness. He takes the place of the wicked to say, if this is the way you go, this is where it leads. And that is the consequence for continuing down the path of wickedness. But Jesus couldn't be held by death and destruction because he was not wicked. He had never sinned. And so Jesus was raised from death and destruction, physically and spiritually, to sit above death and destruction and wickedness. And now he offers the truly blessed life because he's the one who truly is blessed. And he offers that truly blessed life to those who will turn to him in faith and receive his life and walk in that way, the way of Jesus, and have a life with God. Now, maybe that's already you, and if it is, hallelujah. What we're called to is a life where the life of the Spirit dominates us, and it's the things of God that fill our mind, and it's the Word of God that we dwell on as our resting place. So this week, I want to challenge you to think about what you think about. Catch yourself in the moment. Catch yourself in the act. What am I thinking about? Is it an idle mind that's just thinking about all sorts of things, unattended, unrestrained? Catch yourself in the moment. What am I thinking about? We're called to have the same mindset as Christ and his attitude. And when we catch ourselves thinking in the moment, ask yourself this question. Is this thought a Christ-like thought? Is what I'm thinking about right now compatible with a life in the spirit. If not, it's time to stop. It's time to change your mind, repent. That's what that word means. And it's time to think on something better. In fact, it's time to think of the best thing. As Philippians told us earlier, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admir admirable, 
If there is anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. A church, the pinnacle of all things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy are found in Jesus Christ. Think on him this week.